our previous discussions, we have seen that machine learning can be used to solve tasks for which it is difficult to write code directly. So, we instead collect lots of examples of the input-output behavior required by our task, in this case recommending fruits to our users, and use this as training data to learn a machine learning model to solve the actual task. Today, we will be looking at the internal workings of this process. So we will see how to feed data into a machine learning model and how to interpret its output. We will see what is the machine learning model made of. We will also look at, at some details of how machine learning algorithms work and look at some best practices for machine learning experts. My beautiful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Machine learning models, as we have seen, are essentially pieces of code and hence can only understand digital or numerical values. Thus, we need to describe our data point to a machine learning model in the form of numerical values known as features. Similarly, the predictions of the model are also bound to be in the form of numbers, which we need to then interpret to get our actual output. So before we see examples of how to do this description and interpretation, let us quickly refresh what are vectors and matrices. The answer to the question, what is a vector, depends on who are we standing in front of. Are we standing in front of a physicist or a mathematician? However, for machine learning purposes, a vector is simply an ordered set of numbers. These numbers could be negative, positive, integers, fractions, or even zero. Note that the ordering is super important here. Two lists of numbers with have the same set of numbers, but which are ordered differently would be considered two completely different vectors. Similarly, ordered rectangular arrays of numbers are often called matrices. We will revisit more interesting properties of vectors and matrices later. But for now, we start with how to interpret the outputs of a machine learning model. Now, interpreting model outputs for regression tasks is the simplest, since we can simply request the machine learning model to directly output the score we are interested in predicting, be that a spam score or someone's salary. However, recall that in regression applications, it is often the case that the range of the scores are restricted. Taking into account this range is non-trivial, but not that difficult either. So consider this example where we wish to predict the temperature of a city. And naturally, in this case, the scores would lie between, let's say, negative 10 and 50 because that's the usual range of temperatures. The solution is quite simple here and we only need to ask the machine learning model to instead give us scores between 0 and 1 and then scale and shift them ourselves. A very simple scaling and shifting function given here would allow us to take the scores that are between 0 and 1 and change them so that they now start lying between minus 10 and 50. Now, you might be wondering, how do we ask a machine learning model to give scores between 0 and 1? Well, the answer to that is this nice function called the sigmoid function, which can take scores that are real valued, that have no restrictions whatsoever, and convert them to scores between 0 and 1. Such functions are often called activation or quashing functions. And it's important to note that no matter what input we give to the sigmoid function, no matter how large or how small, positive or negative, the output will always be a fractional number between 0 and 1. Note that the use of a sigmoid function also allows the model to be completely free in what output it gives because whichever output it gives will get converted to between 0 and 1 and which can then get scaled and shifted to lie between minus 10 and 50. Now at this point I would like you to take a break and solve this very simple exercise. Instead of 45 degrees, suppose we want the machine learning model to output a temperature of minus 9.8 degrees Celsius. What initial value Z must we start with so that after application of the sigmoid and the scaling and shifting function, we would be able to get the required temperature of minus 9.8 degrees? Think about it. Also, 
you would have noticed that the sigmoid function goes from 0 to 1, but rather gently. Suppose we want a new sigmoid function that goes a bit faster. How would you change the sigmoid function to achieve this? When it comes to classification, we need to find a few more clever ways to ask the machine learning model to output classes or tags or labels because it would be difficult for the model to directly give us English language words such as spam to tell us its prediction. So instead, when dealing with binary classification, we instead ask the model to simply output either a 0 or a 1 and we mentally map these numbers to the classes non-spam and spam respectively. Now, for some machine learning models, it is easier to output a minus 1 or a 1 instead of a 0 and a 1 and you might see this variant in use as well. This trick can actually be extended to multi-class problems as well. For example, if we have 5 classes in our problem, we can ask the model to give out 5 different numbers, let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to tell us which class it wishes to assign to the data point. However, certain machine learning models will struggle to do so, especially deep learning models. The reasons for this are a bit subtle and will become clearer once you're more familiar with machine learning algorithms. For such cases, people have developed alternate ways for the model to tell us its prediction. So in this case, what we do is ask the model to predict a vector with as many coordinates as our classes and then request it to put a 1 in the coordinate corresponding to the class it wishes to assign to the data point and a 0 everywhere else. Such a vector is often called a one-hot vector, possibly because it's hot at only one of the locations. Now you might be wondering how do we get the model to output a one-hot vector. So don't worry about that. There are other activation functions such as the softmax, which we will study later, which can be used to do this. A similar trick will work for multi-label problems as well, except that here we must allow multi-hot vectors which have ones at zero or one or more than one places allowing us to predict any number of labels for a data point. Let us now take a look at how should we describe our data points to the model. There are several types of properties of our data point that we may wish to convey to the model in the hope that it would prove useful in solving the prediction task. The simplest of such properties are numerical properties such as the age of a person, let's say our user, or else the temperature of a patient because these can be directly represented as numbers. The next kind of properties we may wish to describe are categorical properties, where the property can take only a finite set of values. These include gender or blood type or educational qualification. Now, I would like you to take a moment here and think about why it might be improper to represent these properties as single numbers. Let's say representing the blood type AB as 0, A as 1, B as 2, 0 as 3 and so on. Political correctness aside, there seems to be something fundamentally wrong in dumping these property values into a number line since doing so would also mean telling the model that there is something less about the blood type AB because we gave the value 0 as compared to the blood type O which we gave a value of 3. For this reason, it is much more common to use one-hot encodings to communicate the value of such properties to a machine learning model. One can even represent relational properties that, let's say, link data points to each other. These have become very popular with the advent of social graphs and graph neural networks. Say, to tell the model which other data points are connected to a given data point, let's say, as friends or connections. Many hot representations are quite suitable for this purpose. And, for example, in this case, can tell us which all users are friends of this particular user. Now, at this point, you might be wondering about this weird coincidence that the inputs of the machine learning model are structured in the same way the outputs were, as numbers or one-hot vectors or many-hot vectors. Is this just a coincidence? Uh, not really. Because think about it, uh, what we are trying to predict about the data point is just another property or another descriptor for it, right? In fact, it's very popular in machine learning to take certain features of a data point and convert them to other features which are more meaningful or more compact or more useful. 
For example, we could have bagged or binned features. Instead of reporting the grades of a student for every course they have taken, we can just count how many A's they have gotten, how many B's have gotten and so on and so forth. Another very popular class of bagged features are bag of words features where a sentence would be represented as a vector of the dimensionality of the vocabulary of the language with the counts of all the words appearing in the sentence being represented. The other kind of derived features that are very popular are called pooled or aggregated features. These could include taking let's say the friend list of a person and simply counting how many friends they have. Similarly in the grades example, instead of reporting the list of grades on all the courses for a student, we could just report the average grade of the student or the maximum grade they have achieved in any given course. Note that we as the designers of the machine learning algorithms are completely free to choose whichever features of the data point we feel are most useful in solving the task we are interested in. At this point, I would like you to take another pause and think about the daily task that you had proposed in the first discussion we had, which you thought was too difficult for you to write a piece of code to solve it. Can you think of what features would be helpful in solving that task and how would you feed them into the machine learning model? Similarly, in what form would you expect the machine learning model to give you output so that you can interpret that output to solve your task? Think about it. Now that we know how to give and take input and output from the machine learning model, let us shift our focus to the model itself. To do so, let's take a toy example where we wish to predict the salary of our users given some of their personal details such as age, gender and educational qualifications. Note that in this case, our training data will have examples of several users with all their personal details as well as their true salary. Now, in order to build the machine learning model, we need to build some intuition about this task. We might suspect that salary of a person would rise with age, with education level and may also be influenced by gender. But we don't know how much each of these factors influence the salary. So let us conjecture the following set of laws to explain this data. Remember that machine learning at its core is all about discovering laws that govern the data. So let's say that everyone gets a base salary B. You can think of this as minimum wage and that salary would go up by an amount D for every additional year of experience. Salary would further go up by amounts P, Q, R and S if someone has education up to higher secondary, B.Tech, M.Tech or PhD. We assume that the gender of the person also influences the salary by giving them an additional amount that is related to their gender. Now if we take all of these factors into account, we might land up with this expression for the salary of a person in terms of their age, educational qualification and gender. Note that the left hand side of this expression is called y hat because this is really our prediction or conjecture of what the salary could be whereas we are using y to denote the true salary of the person. This same expression can be written much more compactly by taking all the feature values of a user and collecting them into a vector, let's say x as well as taking all these unknowns B, P, Q, R, S, K, L, M and D and collecting them into a separate vector, let's say W. In case you have not seen this notation before, for two vectors A and B which have the same number of coordinates, A transpose B is just a compact way of writing their dot product which is just the sum of their coordinate wise products. Now let's take a moment to understand this expression better. We can visualize this as a function that takes in a data point represented as the vector x and makes a prediction that is just a real number. Note that we could have also applied quashing and scale and shift operations on top of this prediction but we have omitted them for sake of simplicity. More importantly, notice that this function is not completely defined by the input x alone. It has all these other values sitting inside it like the vector w and the real number b which are equally essential to compute the output of this function. These unknown values which are not the input to the function are present in every machine learning model and are called the parameters of the model. So this linear model in our case has two parameters, the vector w and the scalar b. 
the goal of machine learning algorithms in general is to discover parameter values which if used inside the model are able to make predictions that closely match the true outputs in case you're wondering what do we mean when we use the term model this is just a way of referring to the form of the function note that we could have just as well created other functions which look very different but which use the same set of parameters for example instead of adding b to w transpose x we could have raised w transpose x to the power b this would be a very different model but which uses the same set of parameters machine learning algorithms need to figure out which parameter values are good and which aren't a very simple and obvious way to do this would be to call a given set of parameter values good if predictions made using those parameter values match the true outputs and if they don't we would call those set of parameter values bad however we need to make this notion more mathematical so that we can write code to implement the machine learning algorithm and so it's common to use something called a loss function for this purpose let the feature vector for the ith user be called xi and their true salary be yi and their predicted salary be y hat i to find out whether a set of parameter values is good or bad we can measure the mismatch between the true salary of the ith user and the salary that was predicted by the model using those parameter values there are many ways to measure the mismatch and in this case popular examples would be the absolute loss or the least squares loss now note that our training data will have several maybe hundreds or thousands of training points and a given set of parameters might give a different mismatch for each one of them it's a bit risky to rely on a single data point to figure out which parameter values are good and which are bad because there could exist parameter values that do very well on just one data point but will do horribly on the rest for such reasons it's usually common to take the average mismatch across the training data points to figure out which parameter values are good and which are bad now before moving forward i would like you to take a pause and appreciate this beautiful duality in this system where data points and parameters are really evaluating each other so a machine learning model takes as input a data point and gives an output by using the parameter values whereas the loss function takes the parameter values as input and gives a loss value by using a data point really as a parameter so for the loss function the roles are flipped the parameters become the input and the data point really becomes the parameter it's most popular to compute this loss value using the predicted and the true outputs and it's also very common to use the average loss value over the entire training set to evaluate whether a set of parameters is good or bad so the way several machine learning algorithms work is by starting with an initial guess for the parameters for example in this case melbo thought it would be good to just take the average salary of the users in the training set and use that as the base salary and assume that there's no influence of age education or gender this would cause the predictions of the model to be exactly the same on every training data user and as expected the loss value would be quite large this is not a really good model however the idea really is to take this loss value and use it as feedback to keep improving the model and hopefully once we have churned the machine learning algorithm enough we might land up with parameter values that are able to give much better predictions on the data and incur a very low value of loss at which point the machine learning algorithm would stop and output these as the learned parameter values for this model now having discussed about features and models and loss functions i want to take a step back and look at the big picture think about how you as a student prepare for an exam you usually take a lot of practice tests prepare using those practice tests and gain subject knowledge about the exam and then in the actual exam you are able to take the questions and hopefully answer them correctly notice the uncanny similarity between this process and the process by which machine learning works it is no surprise then why these steps are called training and testing in machine learning however 
This exam preparation analogy actually has a lot more to tell us about how we should behave when doing machine learning. Now, whereas you are a beginner in machine learning right now, you will eventually become an expert and hopefully develop lots of impactful applications of machine learning. However, I would urge you to always exercise self-discipline and really treat machine learning as an examination. Just as our brain stores subject matter that we study preparing for a test, the model stores these laws and patterns. We use the subject matter we have learnt during our preparation to solve the exam and we use the model to predict on test data. Just as for us, it's critical to do well on the exam day and not just on the practice tests, it is critical for machine learning algorithms to do well on test data and not just on training data. However, we hope that practice test results would be indicative of how we would perform during the actual exam. And similarly, we hope that training performance would be indicative of how we do on test data. And as you can imagine, this can only happen if there are no out of syllabus questions. And often it is common in machine learning to also assume that training and test data are similar to each other. The next point I cannot stress enough. Just as you should never leak the exam paper before the exam happens, you should never ever see test data during training. And this point really goes beyond morality. We should never look at test data during model training, not just because it is immoral to do so, but because it can give us misleadingly good results for a model that is actually not all that good. And model performance might drop once we see more test data during an actual deployment of your model. This is very similar to what happens in an exam setting. If someone leaks the exam paper of an entrance examination like JEE or GATE, they might end up doing very well on that examination, but they might struggle the moment they enter the institute and start course or thesis work because they really don't have the subject matter knowledge. Thus, it is important to evaluate the model's performance on the test data only once we are done with training because this will provide us with an impartial and trustworthy estimate of the true performance of the model. The paradigm of online learning that we saw last time might seem like an exception to this rule because training and test data was getting muddled up there. However, make no mistake, even in online learning, a data point is first tested upon and then it becomes a part of the train data, not the other way around. We never train on a data point and then test on it. So today we learned how to interact with the machine learning model. We saw that descriptions of data points should be provided to the model in the form of features which could be numerical, categorical or relational and it's possible to even take features and derive other summarized features from them such as pooled features or bin features. We also saw that the outputs of the model can be in the form of numerical values or vectors and must be interpreted according to the application at hand. It is possible to use operations such as activation functions and shift and scale operations on these outputs. We also saw that machine learning models take data points as inputs and use parameter values to make their predictions. Machine learning algorithms on the other hand use loss functions to search for good parameter values that can give outputs that match the true values. Finally, we had an important word of caution that we should never use test data in any form during training. So that's all for today folks. Stay wonderful and I'll catch up with you in the next one.